there's a the one-to-one -one mapping between any memory address in the, in the memory and some 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 uh, block in the cache. There may be multiple sets, but you read it in, then there's some decision as to where to put it and which one to kick out if you have set associativity. But actually, uh, writing is a bit harder. So it's it's we know that we write you know much less than you read. You know, a equals b plus c has got two reads. Uh, and one write, or if you're doing A is BI plus CI of an array, you've got millions of reads and, 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 and only one write for the scalar. So we don't write that much, but you do have to write stuff out. So there are two basic strategies. One is what write through. So um, what you say is you write the data to the cache block into main memory. So when you write data, you say, I'll update the cache and I'll also update the memory. Um, you might say, well, what happens if I'm writing data which hasn't been touched yet? Well, normally, you don't cache on the miss. So what's saying, if you're writing data which isn't in the cache, you don't allocate a cache line. You just write it to the memory. That's a simple, a simple way of doing it. Uh, the other one is write back, where you write to the cache block only, and you only copy the data back to the main memory when the block is replaced. So what you do is... Um, you just keep everything. This is sort of the more obvious situation. You keep everything close to you in the cache, buzzing around in cache. And then if you read some data and it hits a valid entry in the cache, you have to eject one of your cache lines. You then write it to memory. Well, of course, you don't have to write it to memory if it's not been altered, okay? Because then it's, it's consistent with the memory. So you have a dirty or a clean bit. Whenever you modify a cache line, you, you flag it as modified so that when subsequently it's kicked out of the cache, you know whether you need to write it back or not. And in this case, you normally cache on miss. So this is basically saying, I am going to try and keep everything close to me. I'm going to keep everything in the cache. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to read and write in the cache. It's quick. and only update memory when I have to. This is saying, I'll write everything through to main memory, but I'll just keep stuff close to me because just as a, um, a for, for, for speed. So it's kind of two ends of the spectrum. Um, with write back, not all writes go to main memory. That reduces the memory bandwidth. That's one of your bottlenecks. Is that you know writing data to memory, the data, the bus to memory is one of your major bottlenecks, and so this is good, but it's harder to implement. Um, with write through, the nice thing is that the main memory always has a valid copy, and we'll see that um, if you have multiprocessors, uh, then this can be nice. You know, if you have a multiprocessor machine, you always know that the memory is, is, has got a valid copy. Um, you might worry that we're going to get a lot of traffic, but basically you can have a write buffer. So you can basically try and, you don't, you don't immediately write stuff. You, 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 if you've got four writes, you merge them. But these are the two, these are the two, um, the, the, the two uh, methods you can use. So the cache performance is basically, um, if you're going to access memory, then you've got three factors which, which in, in impact. One is the hit time, time to load data from cache to CPU. That's obvious. But also, um, you've got the proportion of accesses which cause a miss, and, and you've got the time to load data from main memory to cache. So this is the cache to CPU. This is, this is what happens if the data is in cache, and you hope this is, this is high. But you're also going to have some fraction of data that isn't, so 20% of your or accesses go to memory and then you have a missed time. And you're gonna try and obviously minimize all three, but the main point is this is very, very high. The missed time, actually load, loading data from main memory is very expensive. And so as a programmer, you can only affect this. This is really, this is the thing that you have to try and target as a programmer. The hardware people can address, address this and this, but you, it, it, the programmer can try and make sure that your data is cache resident. So the, the three C's, the, the three reasons you get cache misses are, um, Compulsory or cold start, this is, this is unavoidable. The first time you ever access a block, you've got to load it into memory. You've got to load it into cache. So that's, that's basically um, always going to happen. Um, so you can't get around that. Capacity misses is where your data doesn't fit in cache. The cache is not large enough to hold all the data. So you have a, one meg you have a two megabyte array and a one megabyte cache. If you zip through the array, by the time you get to the end, you've replaced all the stuff at the start. Stuff at the start. Now, the way to, to, to avoid that in software is to do some kind of tiling. So rather than go through all the array once and then back through it again, you buzz around in smaller sections of the array. So work on the first small part of the array, work on the second part, work on the third part to try and keep stuff cache resident. The one which can kill your conflict misses 
caused by too many blocks mapping to the same set. You're accessing two pieces of data, and coincidentally or otherwise, they both want to live in the same place in the cache. So you read some data in the cache, you read some other data, it maps to the same place in the cache, and it gets kicked out. Now, this, is, this can be reduced if you have a high set associativity, if there's multiple places to go in, but it can still happen in extreme cases. So there's, there, there, there are pathological cases where this happens. And the classic um, case where this happens is if you have, um, you have a large 2D array and you're striding down it in the, uh, I, I'm going to do, well, let's assume the memory is, you've got a large 2D array and the memory is con consecutive in that direction. If you're striding down a column, you're accessing lots of data items which are fixed, uh, a fixed amount apart. It might be a thousand entries apart. If that, is, is some, if that maps onto your cache size, then you're going to hit a problem because all those, those columns are going to try and be, um, trying to map onto the same uh, place in cache. So if you've got a 2D, 2D array and the, 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 the leading dimension is some multiple of the cache, some sub fits nicely with the cache size, then you're going to get problems. And I mean, that's kind of a pathology. Um, and there are ways of doing that. There are ways of avoiding that. You can basically d declare your array slightly bigger than they need to be. You know, you just declare the array to be 1,010, uh, sorry, 1,030 rather than 1,024 or something like that. But you typically get this with power of two. If you have large power of two arrays, this could be, actually this tends not to be a problem in real parallel codes because you have halos. So this used to be a real problem in serial codes. You know, you have 1,024 by 1,024 array, you get nasty, caches that each you know, clashes that you, you scroll down a row or a column you get lots of conflict misses in modern codes you've probably got a halo around you've got an mpi code the actual array is 1026 by 1026 and you don't get that so you don't actually see this as much as you as you used to how do you decide the block size if you have that decision at, at the hardware level i mean if you have very large blocks you've got fewer misses because you, 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 know, you go and photocopy three pages or four pages rather than one. You know, you're going to live in cache much longer. Um, but if they're too large, uh, you don't have as many blocks and you can get more capacity or conflict misses for the, for the same cache size. And also, the larger blocks have a higher miss time. If you have a very large cache line, 128, 256 bytes, if you don't use every byte in there, then you're, you know, if you only use one byte of that 256, you're wasting a lot of bandwidth. Set associativity, um, obviously more sets reduces the number of conflict misses unless you, have a, unless you have a completely pathological case where you're trying to load thousands of, of cache lines into the same place in cache. Um, experiments have shown apparently that eight ways is as good as fully associative. I don't know on what test set, but this is, I've heard this from a number of places. I don't quite know where it comes from. Somebody must have written a paper on this. Eight equals infinity, presumably. Um, but eight, I don't, eight is in practice, seem to be almost as good as fully associative. Obviously, if you, if you have more sets, it, it increases the hit time. It takes you longer to find the data in cache. If you, have, if you have eight places data could be in the cache, you have to look at those eight places before you know whether you've got it or not, and that takes you a lot of time. One way you can actually get around this slightly is to have a victim cache. If you have a pathological case, so basically, um, Set associative cache says for each, for each place in the cache, you have multiple places you can put it, maybe four or eight places. A victim cache says, I'll remember the last few cache lines I threw out. So just in case, you know, I've got a four-way associative cache and he wants to load five cache lines into one set, that, fourth, that, that, that fifth one will just get stuck in and there'll be a little, I won't shut them away, I'll, I'll remember a few extra ones just down here. So you have a small buffer which stores the most recently evicted blocks you can, you can get around some, some more pathological cases. Um, in fact, and we'll see this quite clearly in the exercise, you think that if you run a simple streams test, you read data from memory, you will see a very clear, you know, if you're in ca level one cache, you'll get a high bandwidth. You go to level two, you get a lower bandwidth. You go to level three, you get a lower bandwidth. That would be your classic. You, you'll, you'll generate a curve like that. That doesn't happen. It's very much smoothed out because processors do a lot of prefetching. So you ask for xi, and it goes, well, if he's read xi, he'll probably want xi plus 1, xi plus 2. So it goes away and preloads stuff into cache. So this can be triggered at the hardware level, but you, maybe the hardware says, look, if he's loaded a cache line on the next cache line, he probably wants the next one. I'll start 
prefetching them in. And this actually means that you actually don't, for example, when I ran the exercise, I couldn't see the level one cache because the data was being fetched so, so, so well in, in, into the level two that it was always, I don't quite know how it was working, but prefetching, um, you'll see in the exercise, you can do a simple exercise to turn prefetching off, at least on the Interlagos. You can fool it. But um, prefetching is a very, very um, powerful technique, and it means that actually, often the data is in cache before you even need it. Okay? So for long streaming accesses, the processor will have put the data into cache before you even reference it. That can be done in hardware, um, so, um, yeah, so it, the, the hardware can recognize certain, certain um, patterns and, 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 um, and, and preload them. It, it requires some, some support, but um, some processors, uh, there's some level of, of um, how sophisticated you can be, whether it recognizes strided patterns, but most hardware will recognize simple linear patterns and start prefetching. Of course, you could do it in software. Um, you can basically put dummy loads in, which actually just load data into cache if you've got an instruction. Um, so, so I said hardware is typically very simple. The compiler can place prefix instructions ahead of loads. So um, basically, again, the compiler can, can, the compiler can say, well, he's looping through this array. He's doing some calculation. Then he's going on to the next element. I could preload pre that data. I could put like a dummy load in. Um, uh, you don't want to do it too far ahead. You don't want to load data you're not going to need, but the compilers, some compilers do this kind of thing anyway. Um, do, do, put, do, put, um, do, do software prefetching as well. Um, so in reality, we have multiple levels of cache. We don't have a processor in cache. We have level one, level two, and all the way down to main memory. So um, obviously, you want them to get bigger as you go down. Otherwise, there's no point. You know, if you want something in level you want something in level one, you want it to likely to be in level two, so it's quicker. You, these need to get bigger as you go down for it to make sense. So uh, second level cache should be much larger than the first. Otherwise, you know, if you miss in level one, you'll miss in level two. Uh, second level cache is, is slower, but hopefully faster than main memory. And you can have different block sizes, though this can cause problems. Well, I, I don't know. I don't know how common it is on... Mm, Going back along with the DEC Alpha chip had different had a bigger level two block size than a level one block size, and that meant that when you thought you were doing reads, you were also doing writes. Because you tried to write sixteen, you tried to write sixty-four bytes into, you tried to flush sixty-four bytes from the level one cache to the level two cache. The level two cache was one hundred twenty-eight byte line, so it then had to read it's bigger cache line from memory and merge them together. So I don't know, I, I don't know how common this is, but I in practice have seen problems when um, the cache lines don't match up. Maybe that was just a pathology on the deck alpha. Um, typically, everything in level one must be in level two. So there's a kind of a inclusion, you know, that, that basically if something's in, in level one, it's also in level two and also in lev level three. Okay, you don't have gaps. And this will, can give you, this is often useful in, in cache coherency. Because you can see this caching is complicated enough, but it's kind of obvious that if you have a multiprocessor system, I might have a copy of the, some data in the cache. Somebody else has a copy of the data in their cache. They modify the data. How do I know it's been modified? So cache co caches are complicated enough, but in a multiprocessor system, you have multiple caches. And you know, you, then in practice, in principle, there could be complete anarchy. So that you have to come up, we'll cover that in the next lecture, ways to make sure that you know that you've got the most up-to-date for um, um, version in memory. So three levels of cache are commonplace. Uh, separate level one caches for instruction and data, combined level two and level three caches for both. I think that's true on the Interlagos. I, 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 I'll try and show you a block diagram of the Interlagos process. It won't be relevant to the next lecture. Um, uh, the Interlagos process, I think, has private level one cache, some sharing in level two, and the level three is shared across even more processes. It's quite complicated. Uh, but it is very, you know, very complicated to design. But um, so we, this is the, the sort of generic idea of, 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 of the, you know, the speed and the cost goes up, registers being the best, main memory being the worst, but the capacity obviously goes up in the other direction. My gigabytes of memory, tens of megabytes of L3, a bit less L2, L1. When I write a program, you know, I do have to worry if data is in cache. The whole thing about caches is it make the illusion with caches is, is that there is no cache. 
In your mind, the model is there are registers in this main memory. That's the model. That's how it works. Okay? That's the programming model. The implementation is much more complicated. You have data flowing up and down these intermediate caches. But the model is that you can just read and write from main memory. So functionally, you see no difference in your program. Your program works regardless of whether there's caches or not. However, if you use the caches well or not well, depending on which way you, you stride through memory, it can have orders of magnitude difference in the performance of your program. The, the first exercise was really to run, effectively, just to run a streams benchmark. I did consider just using streams, but as a piece of code, streams is just a bit, a bit hairy. So I just wrote, um, uh, yeah, memory fit size four. I just wrote a simple little program which reads memory. I, I'm sure it's quite sim similar to what Neil gave out. I only have a C version, I'm afraid, uh, but the code is so simple. I mean, uh, if you're a Fortran program, it should be quite obvious what to do. So really, we're just looking at single processor things here. So if you just compile the code and run on one thread, you'll see bandwidth figures. Um, but if you, do a, if you plot a graph of bandwidth against, against data size, you, you know, you, the, the, the canonical thing is you'll see some kind of step function as you, as you variously hit cache thresholds. Now, it's not quite as simple as that. Um, but you should be able to estimate the size of the various caches. And I'll, I'll get, I have the figures for the interlagos there, so we'll see if they make sense. This is an interesting one. Edit the code so the summation loop runs from n minus 1 to 0. So you're, reading, you're not reading data forwards 0 to n. You're reading it backwards n minus 1 to 0. You might not think that makes a lot of difference, but you'll see it does make a lot of difference. And the other thing is you can work out what the, the, the cache block or cache line size is by using non-unit strides in the loop. So you basically... You access uh, data here, and here, and here, and here, and here. And um, that's very inefficient because you're not using all the data within a cache line. But when your stride, so, so your, your memory bandwidth drops as you increase the stride. Um, because basically you're, you're reading in the same amount of data, but you're only accessing half of it. But when the, block, when the stride is uh, bigger than or equal to the cache line size, then your bandwidth will be constant. So you can, you, can do a, uh, you can do a graph of memory bandwidth against stride in a loop and, and quite easily get the, um, work out the cache line size from that. You should work in the cache directory for these exercises, and the code is called cache.